Okay, John, so the first part of the show, uh, mm -hmm. we'll ask you about yourself. And uh, how you got with uh, the second part, I'll talk about your technology and service. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here on Think Tech Talks on a given Monday, our first show of the week, uh, and it's the SOEST Hour, and our, and our special guest this week is John Burns, uh, who is a coral researcher and PhD candidate at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, and he's um, on the Big Island, am I right, John? That is correct, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Oh yeah, thanks for joining us, we really like to talk science, or at least to allow scientists an opportunity to talk science. That's the, that's the operative part. So can you tell us, um, you know, what is it to be a coral researcher and PhD candidate at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I guess most of the time it's a lot of work and surprisingly probably to a lot of people, it's a lot of work behind the computer. You know, we get, we get to go out and do some really amazing surveys of the reefs themselves all over uh, Hawaii and the main arc of main Hawaiian Islands and then also sometimes up to the northwest western Hawaiian Islands but while we get some really enjoyable time underwater doing pretty intensive surveys then we got to come back do a lot of uh, data entry a lot of number crunching write up publications and then also try get the information out about what we're doing with shows like this and any chance that we can oh yeah I think it's really important that you get out otherwise we don't know we want to know we want yeah. to know that our re reefs are being saved, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, okay, so you're in a, a Ph.D. program at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Is, now, is that uh, separate or part of SOWEST itself? So, it's, I guess it's a little confusing. Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology is, it's part of the university, and it's kind of its own entity devoted to marine studies. So it's physically located out in Kaneohe Bay on the east side of Oahu, and it's, it's a really amazing place to work. They've got tremendous lab facilities, uh, amazing staff of researchers and principal investigators, but since it's kind of its own entity out there, it has researchers that are a part of SOEST, that are a part of the biology department like myself. So it kind of allows multiple departments and faculty to all be located in one place to do marine biology research, which is great because anytime you get a lot of great minds under one roof, it, it really spurs a lot of collaborative research and kind of helps give you ideas that you may not have been able to think of on your own. So why did you get into this? Um, this you know, this is, it's a, I mean, to most people it's arcane, I'm sorry to say that. It's <laughs> <laughs> dealing with tiny, biological objects uh, in, in, a, in a sea that's infinite in size and to what end and why you know what what, what turns you on to marine biology in the first place yeah that's a it's a really good question and and there's definitely times I won't lie that I'm spending weeks trying to study you know one tiny microscopic <laughs> cellular function of corals and I really do wonder, okay, what, where have I gone in my life direction that I'm spending all this time focusing on something so abstract to my day-to-day -day life? It can yes, get a little yes. crazy. Um, but I think what really drives me in a lot of people is that unknown. I mean, you're really, you're doing all of this because we still have so much to figure out. And I think what surprises a lot of people about coral reefs or just the ocean in general is you know, it always seems in this day and age with technology at the level that it is that we just have everything figured out, that we would know all the organisms that are in the ocean, we know what they do, but I still feel like for the most part we don't know anything. You know, we're, we're just discovering things every single day and what we do know we're tending to flip it on its head all the time with new advancements in, in science technology and new research approaches. So I would say from the science standpoint, what keeps me going and keeps me excited is just you're, you're discovering something new and you have the potential to apply new techniques to old problems. And, and that's exciting. Even when it's really tedious work and you, you know, you're pulling your hair out, you still get to the point, which is rare, I think, in a lot of fields that you can, you can bring information to the table that advances your field. You can find things that no one else has looked at. And that is a lot of fun. Yeah. Which strikes me also that, let me throw this and see if it, it resonates with you. Um, you know, when we were kids, I mean my generation, not yours, when we were kids, uh, the ocean was an infinitely big place. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, you know, it has always been, I mean, up to that point, up till recent years, it has always been an infinitely big place. Um, so what was going on in there, was, you know, I don't know, it was, uh, it was unfathomable. Oh, there's a term that seems appropriate. Unfathomable, <laughs> okay? Now the ocean is a smaller place, and we all mm -hmm. see it as smaller. You can get across it in less time. You can know more about it. Uh, there's, there's no corner of the ocean that we can't get to, really. I mean, think of all those sunken submarines and the like, and all those shipwrecks that we can now yeah. look at and pull up. I mean, it's, there's, there's, no, there's no more you know, secret corners of the ocean. And so th then, of course, there's this whole notion the planet is, is, is vulnerable. The planet is under attack under attack by human beings and all their industry and what have you. You know, it's not only climate change, it's, it's a general waste of the, of the environment. Um, and so it's, it seems like to me anyway, that your science is more important because we have to know what's there so we can protect it. We have to know what's there so we can preserve it against destruction. Uh, maybe it's really valuable. Maybe it's in some sort of symbiotic or second or third degree symbiotic relationship with us that helps us uh, in our quality of civilized life. And if it goes away, we don't even know what it is, but if it goes away, we may find that the, the rug is being pulled out in some way. And therefore, uh, it's more important that we, we check this out. It's more important that we do the science now, somehow, with the shrinking and more vulnerable ocean. Does that, does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with the point you made that while the oceans are vast and huge with the sort of exponential increase in discoveries and our ability just to visually see the ocean, it has become a seemingly smaller place where we're really starting to see our impacts everywhere we look. You know, there's deep sea research going on in the ocean in places that seem so far removed from humanity or the impacts of humanity and we'll still see effects from human civilization all the way in those you know minute deep areas so it, it's just starting to become more and more apparent that what we do has an impact on the surroundings around us and you know you crunch the numbers seven billion people you know it's a lot of people even with the best intentions we just have to accept that we're always going to have an impact on our surrounding environment but we also need to realize that we're a part of that environment so what we can do now to understand how those environments respond to the impact and the stressors that we impose can give us a lot of valuable information about the best way we can move forward to also preserve these environments because we do depend on them. Like you're saying, I mean, coral reefs, you can draw some really simple but effective analogies to the rainforest where there are these sure. small areas of the world, but we get so much resources from them, be it fish, uh, economics through tourism or pharmaceuticals, natural products. And like you're saying, the wealth of resource and economy in these environments is probably largely untapped. And one of the worst things that could likely happen is that we don't do what we can to maintain these environments, and when we really need them, they're already gone. So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what you're saying is, is more true today now than it's probably ever been. Okay, now all of this takes us to the fact that you're in the Big Island, and in Kona, is it? Uh, Hilo side. Hilo side, you know. Yeah. And, um, and you're, you're there in, a, in a, an office or an apartment with has a small dog in there somewhere. So <laughs> yeah. I, I understand this because I do a lot of work at home and I have a small dog that interrupts me all the time and it, it sort of lends a, an additional degree to the, you know, a, a party to the conversation. And let me say also that my small dog has never violated a confidence, never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure no. yours hasn't either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, so I, I live and work on the Big Island. Um, I do a lot of work through the university here at UH Hilo as well, and mm -hmm. I'm studying a number of sites around this island because it's so unaffected compared to Oahu, where we have real minimal human civilization here. Um, <laughs> a lot less population. Sometimes it seems like a civilization a little bit in the past. Yeah. Um, but it's a great place to see how reefs are changing before the point that you see, say, uh, on the south shore of Oahu, Waikiki, where they've all pretty much been decimated. So, yeah, I tried to work at home because it's a little bit less busy than the lab, but I actually have three dogs here, and uh, <laughs> two of them I've got, like, right underneath me that I'm trying to keep calm because they're very much, uh, they love attention, and so if it was up to them, they'd probably be on the interview right now. So, yeah. 
if they want to say something, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so okay, so here we are, and we're we're joining you by Skype um, from Hilo, and um, you have, you know, the, the possibility of doing your work uh, in terms of dealing with the samples you find, and also doing, you know, computer calculations uh, right there, and somewhere along the line. Um, this show with you today, John, got named 3D Under the Sea. <laughs> so <laughs> we really have to know how that all translates into 3D Under the Sea. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, so a large part of my motivation personally with science is doing something with a purpose to people primarily, considering that a lot of the research funds is, is public tax dollars supported. and really I start to lose sense of the purpose if what I'm doing can't give back to people in general and also spark an interest in these environments. So one way I felt that we were, were kind of lacking in marine science was our ability to share these environments with people. You know, it's a very small number of people that get to go scuba diving. I couldn't really afford to do recreational scuba diving until I started doing it for research and mm -hmm. for work. And so I looked to a lot of different technologies that are being used in, in terrestrial, so systems on land, and thought, okay, what would be great to use in the marine environment that could also improve our ability to study these, these locations, but also share information and show it to the general public and people who are interested in, as well. And it's fun because underwater, it's just so much more difficult to do anything, right? I mean, you can't talk to your dive buddy, uh, your cameras need fancy housings, so all of a sudden, uh, most available technologies on land are just no longer functional underwater. Mm -hmm. But there was one really cool one I saw called, and this is one of those you know big fancy science words that is confusing, uh, structure from motion photogrammetry. But uh, basically, it one more time. So yeah, it's structure from motion photogrammetry, mm -hmm. and what this is is sort of an old technique, but. It, it's similar to how they used to use stereo cameras to take pictures of things and then image it in three dimensions. But, you know, as I'm sure you talk about on this show a lot, technologies are just rapidly improving every single day. And so this has been used for archaeology sites and big cities where they'll take now just single lens uh, digital cameras, but nicer SLRs with, with fancy lenses and you take a ton of images that overlap almost 80, 90 percent of a scene and then you're able with this new software to reconstruct it three-dimensionally. So I figured, okay, well on land they either fly helicopters or drones, but since we're underwater we actually have the advantage to just hover and float above the environment as if we were flying over it. Uh -huh. So the reef plots where we've been studying coral health, I've spent the last few years imaging these with cameras just taking sometimes thousands of pictures with high overlap of that whole scene and then I run it through these algorithms and we've had to do a lot of work because you know you, light refracts differently underwater and you run into complications but it does allow us to reconstruct these reefs in three dimension and then you have this model that you can manipulate you can print it in 3D and now you can get metrics like volume of coral you know structural metrics so very very uh, complex metrics too, high resolution and it's really neat because for so many years we've only looked at corals with just 2d measures so we'll tell people oh there's 70 percent coral here there's 40 percent coral here but to really see it is very powerful and then to see the different structural complexities is really useful for fisheries research because these corals are making homes to all the little fish and the little invertebrates so it's been really exciting and fun because not only are we getting new data that's really useful for characterizing the sites, but we share these with the public and, and people love seeing the reef in 3D. You know, it's, it's a whole new way of visualizing it and it gives you a different respect too when you see changes that have occurred over time. So let me see if I understand. The, the, the graphic you were just showing um, has one photo on the top that looks like it's not 3D and then mm -hmm. one in the middle that is 3D and the one the bottom is kind of an element of the 3D. Um, so, and, and that presumably is the true color that you would see with an underwater camera that, that's uh, kind of aquamarine. What an appropriate term, eh? Aquamarine <laughs> color. <laughs> Am yeah. I right about all that? Yeah, everything underwater ends up, unfortunately, pretty aquamarine because the, uh, 
all the short wavelength colors like red, orange, yellow, you know, they get a, kind of taken up really quickly. So all that you're left with seeing everything kind of looks blue and, and aquamarine, if you will. Um, so yeah, one thing we're trying to experiment with is to improve the lighting so we can really bring it to life with the, the actual colors. Oh yeah, how interesting. Anyway, so, so now when you have multiple shots uh, in this graphic, then you have software, as, as we do over the water too, to yeah. stitch them together and give them greater definition. In fact, to give them a 3D look. And uh, once you have the 3D, then you can measure the volume in this case, the volume of the coral, you can tell how much coral is there in the picture because you can have another algorithm that will look around this 3D image and measure, um, measure it, measure the volume of what's in the 3D image. Uh, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, pretty much. We use a couple different software programs, but once we've rendered it three-dimensionally, we essentially have a topographic map. Yeah. just like people have for landscapes. So then we can use topography software and look at elevational changes, slope, contour. We can look at volume, like you're saying, pretty much you know, all very important parameters that are used for terrestrial studies that we haven't been able to apply to the marine environment. So it's really useful. Say, for instance, you wanted to come back to one site and see how has the volume of coral changed in the past five years. Now, with this technology, we could actually do that. Oh, that, you know, I was going to ask you about that. The, uh, the dynamic of coming back to mm -hmm. exactly the same location and taking another picture and seeing the delta factor, that would mm -hmm. be pretty exciting. Because then oh, you yeah. can try to figure out what made it change. Right, and especially in the face of large global stressors like ocean acidification where everybody's worried that coral growth will slow down we finally have a technique where we could go out and measure growth of corals over time and see if certain species are more affected than others or certain areas are growing less than others and also after disturbance events like we just had this big hurricane luckily we had taken 3d images of a site that had been heavily impacted and so now we can go back out collect another set of images, make new 3D models, and actually see how much coral might have been lost or destroyed. Yeah, oh, that's, oh, that's great. You know, in, in, in effect, the, uh, the storm works to our advantage in that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at, least, at least there's a bright side somewhere. Uh, that's yeah. John Burns. Uh, he's a uh, researcher, coral researcher, and PhD candidate at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, uh, the Big Island, developing techniques to create 3D models of coral habitats. Uh, this is uh, Think Tech Talks. It's the SOAS Hour, the School of Ocean, Earth Science, and Technology at UH Manoa. And we're talking about 3D under the sea. There's a rhyme there. We'll be right back after this very short break. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina. It's my privilege to be the host of Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako, what does that mean? Well, many people have heard of a pule kako, let's pray together. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. And every week, Monday from 2 to 3 o'clock, you will see movers and shakers and other people who are working together to build a better economy, government, and society. Again, I'm Kelee Akina on the Ehana Kako weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. See you here Mondays 2 to 3. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on Think Tech Talks, the SOWEST Hour on Monday in the 1 to 2 block with Sean Burns, who joins us by Skype from the Big Island, from Hilo. And he's a coral researcher and PhD candidate at the Institute of Marine Biology there. And, I, and I, you know, my, my limited scientific experience at least in part, is derived from the Hawaii Science Fair, where I, <laughs> I get to ask all those kids, what is their hypothesis? You yeah. know, and, and, and all kinds of stuff flows from that. So <laughs> let, me, let me ask you my science fair question, John. What's the hypothesis you're working on in terms of dealing with the 3D uh, investigation of coral reefs? That's a really good question. I guess primarily from the most simple level, the hypothesis is just, are there specific corals that provide different habitat structures than others? So are there species that are maybe more important for habitat or fisheries dynamics than others that we need to be more concerned about protecting in the face of uh, you know, anthropogenic stressors? Because 
one thing we've seen with corals is that the more high complex fast growing species tend to be more susceptible to diseases or disturbance and so before we start seeing losses of those corals i'd really like to see and understand what type of three-dimensional habitat dynamics might we be losing yeah so this is really when you when you shake it and bake it this is all about finding out what we need to know to protect the coral reefs around these islands um, and if you can look at them more carefully then maybe you can find things that will enable you to understand their decline on occasion understand what makes them healthy and uh, you know take steps to continue to have them continue to be healthy um, but you know I, I've noticed that um, there's a lot of people in Hawaii who some of them science and some of them semi-science if you will call it uh, environmental you know observation um, a lot of people care about the coral reefs um, and I, I just wonder you know if that's part of your world system you know what I mean is do we need the coral reefs for these islands to remain what they are today uh, if all the coral reefs went away what would happen what would happen to the you know uh, the, the that part of the ecosystem which depends on them what would happen to life on Bishop Street, if you will? What, mm -hmm. what happens to life in Hilo, uh, if you will? Uh, I'm just wondering what the connection is, and I, and I and I think I will, I will, you know, have to agree that there it's an industry. I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of people here in these islands are concerned about coral reefs, not only for the Hawaiian Islands, but for all islands that have coral reefs. But what's the big deal about that? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and. There's a number of ways to address that, but you know, I, I think primarily they're socially, economically, culturally vital to this place, Hawaii in general. I mean, Hawaiians have always had an amazing understanding of the importance of corals because they're very much a foundational organism, you know, so you can kind of think of them as the cement or foundation of a house. You know, they are the backbone of our marine ecosystems, a hundred percent. If we lose the corals, we lose the structure, we lose the home for all the other organisms, and we basically lose all the resources that we depend on from these environments. And you can even see that in the Kumulipo, the Hawaiian creation chant, the coral polyp was the very first organism that then goes on to support all of life. And, and I really think you can draw that connection to modern day. I mean, to get into the economics now, like you're saying with it being an industry, I mean, I've seen projections that corals are worth upwards in the four to five billion per year for dive tourism, uh, research funds, you name it. So I mean right there the economy loss, if we lost all of our corals would be devastating. And then beyond just economics, they really serve to protect coastlines. So you know if you go out and look off the south shore of Oahu, you see those breaking waves off in the distance. And that reef is really a huge buffer to wave energy and storms that protects the island. So you lose that natural protection from storms. And I mean, essentially the list goes on and on. So a lot of the well-being and of, of so many people here would be affected by those factors, as well as food-wise. I mean, geez, they're supporting so much fish populations, you know, in terms of what we what we live and depend on to eat, it would be a huge impact as well. So I mean, it, it's true, like you're saying, people are very aware of the importance of coral. They're really tuned in, but it, you know, it makes you stop and think about it for a second and, and really respect these systems when you kind of draw all those factors out and think, man, we would, like life as we know it would change dramatically if we lost mm -hmm. these environments. You know, I, I, I just remembered something that I had forgotten about. You know, we did a movie at the Honolulu Aquarium um, back a couple of years ago, and out in back of the aquarium, there were these tanks that had coral samples, I mean, mm -hmm. living, living coral of many different species of coral, or subspecies, whatever it is, uh, okay, and um, this, it was being preserved there. It was mm -hmm. being preserved so it could be, uh, I don't know about sold, but exported to other islands elsewhere in the Pacific uh, where they might have a decline in coral, this would help them recover. Uh, and it strikes me that you know, Hawaii is a, a sort of a, a great place um, to be a laboratory for coral. In mm -hmm. fact, more than that, to be a place where we can grow coral like they do in the back of the aquarium there and actually help replant coral 
uh, in the islands around the Pacific. We have the capability, and we could. Are we doing that now? Do you know? Have you heard much about this? Yeah, that's a really great question. So that's a lot of research, uh, specifically at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology in Kaneohe, because they're on that island. They have flow through seawater systems, so they can pump seawater from the ocean through the lab and right back out into the ocean, which allows them to do what you're talking about is make tanks that are essentially the real seawater conditions and then you're able to grow corals in there and they'll survive. And so there's several labs focused on understanding, you know, what factors affect the ability of these corals to live, grow and thrive. And so I think you might have had my advisor, Dr. Ruth Gates, on the show because she's recently been getting a lot of attention from the Paul Allen Foundation. She has proposed and, and is in the process right now of trying to figure out, you know, what specific species, what genotypes of corals will do the best to survive in, say, harsh conditions or conditions we might see in the future. Thus, we would have the ability to promote almost like stocks or genotypes of species that'll survive most likely in future conditions. So that is something people are trying to do. It's very difficult, I can say right now, because you know, for being a simple organism that a lot of people think is sometimes just a rock, they're very, very biologically complicated and they depend on symbionts. So there's little algae that live inside the corals that really affects their physiology and their performance. There's also bacteria that will be specific to each coral. So while it is a great idea and a lot of researchers are pursuing this, it's very, very complex to kind of tease apart all the dynamics that make these corals survive and figure out exactly you know, what promotes, say, a super coral. But it is something people are focused on because like you're saying, it's, it's a great idea and a great way to hopefully promote you know, maintaining healthy functional reefs in future conditions, which might be more uh, difficult for them to live than it is now. Yeah, so interesting. So that so we could find out what bacteria they need symbiotically, what mm -hmm. other kinds of uh, ocean life they need or they can benefit from. And yeah. we can be the experts right here. I, in fact, I suggest to you, we already are the experts right here. Does anybody <laughs> yeah. in the world know as much about coral as the, uh, you know, the research establishment here in Hawaii? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would say no, right? But I'm a little bit biased, yeah, I guess. Okay, well, what does Woods Hole know anyway? Yeah, exactly. They don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> well, let me talk about uh, you know other you, you know you're in you're in Hilo for ver doing your work there for various reasons, but you went to uh, Midway mm -hmm. just only last month for with a NOAA um, research expedition to the and I'm going to try to pronounce this on the first try uh, the Papahanua Mokuakea. How close was that? Uh, Marine close. National Monument. Why don't you say it? Yeah, so we went up to the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. <laughs> What's it like there? Does it look like the Washington Monument or the Lincoln Monument? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only slightly different. A uh, little lower elevation. Um, you know, it, it's, it's such an amazing opportunity, and I'm so grateful to the staff at NOAA and the, the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument office. Uh, they, they really do an amazing job of helping support research and researchers like myself from HIMB to go up to that remote area and, and study corals and, and other you know, organisms in those environments. Because a lot of people don't realize that the Hawaiian archipelago goes well beyond Kauai. So you know, the, the monument, it's actually the largest, one of the largest, it might be the largest uh, marine monument in the world. And I think it's you know, I might be misspeaking here, but I, I want to say it's like two thirds the length of the continental U.S. Wow. from Kauai all the way up to Cure, which is just past Midway. So, yeah, it's a tremendous place. There's a bunch of low line atolls and little islands like Midway. And we get to go up and, and try understand how corals and fish and other organisms in these marine environments function outside of human pressures, because being all the way up there, they're completely removed from human population. So, it's a great way to see what happens in these environments when there isn't fishing pressure. And the first thing that strikes you is there's a lot more fish, you know? I mean, you're down there diving and you've got huge alua and sharks just all over the place. So it, it's quite exciting and you do see some very dramatic differences from the main Hawaiian Islands. So a monument then is a kind of a, a structure of the ocean bottom uh, that, that sort of comes out from, from the bottom 
and acts as a, as a mountain under, under the water. Is that what it is? Yes. Give, give so us it's a definition a, as you see it. So the monument itself is physically defined as the area that just encompasses the rest of that island chain. Mm -hmm. But geologically, it's, it's like the remaining islands that have moved off the hot spot that the big island is on right now that have shifted to the northwest and sunk over time. So that's what an atoll is. It's an island like the Big Island that over millions and millions of years subsides until you have pretty much just the very tip of the island, if anything, sticking up in the middle. And that reef that developed around it has formed a big barrier reef around that atoll. So, yeah, we kind of get to, you know, jump back in time geologically and go see the islands up there in contrast to what they are down here. So if I, if I take a, a, a genomic look uh, at the coral that you're studying um, at Hilo, mm -hmm. and then I compare that with the coral at, at Midway. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it going to be the same coral, or are you going to find it, you know, that from a chemical and genomic point of view, it's, it's different? I mean, it must be a thrill to discover a new variety, but is it a new variety out there? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, coral speciation is, is tricky because they hybridize a lot. Yeah. Uh, so it's difficult to say, you know, which exact species is, is entirely different from others. But we do see really exciting species up there, specifically acroporids, that we almost never get to see in the main Hawaiian Islands. And so, yeah, it's, it's amazing. The reefs sometimes look entirely different. And it's not so much that there might be like a new unique species. There are species up there that don't exist down here. But what's most fascinating is just how the composition is totally different. So which species dominate and what morphologies they exhibit can be totally different than what they see down here. And that's where the 3D modeling is really nice because we can see exactly how the structures differ between the two sites and which species are the most different. And, and that is really fun to see. Yeah, so you can see the 3D modeling here and examine it, you know, with, in, in, the, in, the, you know in your laboratory very carefully, uh, you know, essentially with a computer microscope on it. Um, yeah. And then you can go to Midway and examine it with the same 3D kind of approach, and you can make a very careful comparison to see any real differences that, that are observable between the uh, species here and the, what do you call it, the hybrid over there, and, yeah. and find out how it's changed. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's definitely, yeah, there's different species there than we see here. and. And what's nice is, you know, I'm, I'm really a, a coral biologist by trade, and, and I've been very focused in diseases affecting corals. So for me, it's really nice because I can go to two places, one here in the main that is affected by human presence, one up in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands in the monument that's not, and I can say, okay, now that we've removed some of these variables, which species are most dominant? What growth forms are they taking? Because a lot of coral species can grow in many, many different forms, which is what makes them so amazing, but also so difficult to study. And so it's nice to have two totally different environments to compare that are in the same archipelago. It's really exciting. Yeah, so, you know, it strikes me that if you have um, a, a coral species that grows in and around these islands, say, uh, you know, where there's effluent coming out of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, canal, the like we have on, you know, on, on, uh, on the Mackay side of Oahu, um, then, you know, there's more pressure on the coral, and therefore the coral that survives is arguably hardier. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look in, uh, in Midway, you have more ideal conditions, uh, not as much pressure on the coral. This is the, these are the conditions which, the, which coral, you know, originated with. It's, it's the primordial soup, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so it's easier for the coral to exist there. So now you, you can make some really extraordinary comparisons between the hardier coral that's here under pressure from so many man-made, you know, uh, attacks and the, uh, uh, you know, and the more friendly environment off Midway. And I suppose in that way you can learn exactly chemically what makes a coral more, uh, more hardy and what makes it more vulnerable, I suppose. And thus, you can learn how to save coral, because yeah. now you know the difference. You know how to make it hardier, um, but you know what makes what, well, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. No, it's really exciting, because, you know, we, we survey a number of islands and atolls along that chain, all the way up to Midway, and, 
you know, as a disease, coral disease biologist, it, it's very interesting because there's some diseases that I see here on the Big Island or on Oahu. For instance, I've worked a lot with uh, growth anomalies, which are like tumors that grow on the corals. And we often are wondering, well, what on earth causes these tumors? And we've tried, and not just myself, I mean, all researchers studying coral disease have had a really hard time figuring out you know, the exact causative agent. But then we have seen some of these growth anomalies growing on corals up at French Frigate Shoals and other sites. And so that gives us a really interesting clue because, okay, if they're existing on corals that are totally removed from some of these human systems, maybe it's something that naturally occurs in the marine environment, or maybe it's genetically inherited. You know, the jury's still out, but yeah, like you're saying, it, it provides us with a lot of different clues and a really nice way to study and compare the environments. Does the, uh, is, is a coral as an animal, you know, useful outside its native environment? In other words, is there a possibility that there's um, pharmaceuticals in coral? That maybe oh. something in coral can cure cancer, who knows what? Uh, the coral can be used on, you know, in terms of um, uh, helping people in some way on, on terrestrially? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we're in a really exciting age now where we're starting to understand them genetically much at a much higher detail than we ever have before. And another colleague of mine, uh, Maggie Sogan, she's doing her PhD study and look at the, looking at the metabolites that actually form within the coral. And so, you know, because they're an animal, like you said, they have a number of immune functions that while being sort of, I guess, evolutionarily conserved, they still are very useful for that coral avoiding to get sick or be you know, taken over by stressors. And we're only now figuring out some of these exact proteins or metabolites or pathways to creating these that exist in the coral. And it could give us a lot of clues for natural products or immune functions or uses for humans in battling in a number of diseases. I mean, if you look at a lot of the treatments that we use for a number of diseases, they have many times been derived from, you know, environments like rainforests, and I think the coral reefs could probably provide a number as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, I always saw coral, aside from the one time when I got coral in my foot, which I didn't appreciate at all. <laughs> I was mad at coral at that point. You uh, can't I had to clean my foot out with some kind of lemon juice or vinegar, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, I always saw coral as uh, very benign, you know, very sort of friendly to humans, um, and uh, maybe one day it will help us. But you know what concerns me, and this is my last question to you, John, uh, you, 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 you spoke in passing about climate change before, and yeah. um, you know, I mean, uh, when you have a, a steady increase in temperature in the ocean, uh, an increase beyond where the ideal environment is for any given uh, animal, um, over time, you're going to change the way that animal operates. You're going to you're going to change the way the, the, what what survives. You know, um, mm -hmm. the the hardiness of it, uh, the natural selection of it, and maybe you're going to kill it off completely over time. So I wonder if you've seen that. I wonder if that's being studied, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on on how climate change is going to affect the coral, and thus how the coral is you know, going to be useful or less useful for, for people? No, that's a really good question. You know, it, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people want hard black and white answers regarding issues like climate change because they hear about these frightening projections and loss of environments within 50 years and everybody wants to know. And I get this question all the time from friends that, you know, aren't involved in science. Is that true? Is this stuff real? Is it really going to happen? And you know, the reality is it's, it's a big gray area and it's really difficult to say exactly what conditions will exist in 50 years or 100 years. But I think what's undeniable is that changes are occurring and human population is increasing exponentially. So we absolutely see in, in, in many areas around the world devastating losses of corals that have been, you know, usually caused by disease outbreaks. But just like with humans, you know, while the disease may kill you, it was the number of factors that might have lowered your immunity at another point in the first place. So, for instance, in the Caribbean, you know, there's been a large amount of coastal development, a lot of sediment and pollution put onto those environments. And like you said before, corals are animals. So their immune system can only handle so much. And if we stress them out with our presence, be it, you know, even tourism, when you're down there, you know, and, and you get coral in your foot and you kick the coral, you know, that stresses it out. It exposes it to pathogens. 
and then maybe the surface uh, seawater temperature is higher because of a little bit of global warming and all these factors start to play together and that's many times why we're seeing complete losses of coral cover on a lot of reefs and it, it's kind of scary what's happening around the globe luckily in hawaii and the indo-pacific we haven't seen as many massive disease outbreaks and loss of coral but that's also why in a way we're racing to understand as much about them as we can now so if we start to get into a slippery slope where we're seeing you know coral mortality on the rise hopefully we can isolate certain elements that maybe are manageable you know people ask me a lot i do a lot of outreach work here and it's you know what can i do to save corals and i, I think people would be surprised what you can do i mean just in your backyard almost everything you dump out you know, water-wise, it's going to flush into the ocean. You can always reduce the amount of trash that you're, you're, you're wasting, your carbon input. You know, there's a ton of ways on a local scale to improve your watershed and your reefs. And if everybody tunes into that, and I think we take proactive choices, you know, we don't have to sit idly by and watch all the reefs disappear. Hopefully, we can promote healthy reefs however we can. So where can people uh, read about what they can do? Is it your site, some other site? Can you direct them to uh, some, some yeah, reference there? Yeah, we've got a website actually where we make all of our data available. So all the sites I study on the main Hawaiian Islands, all the way up to the Northwest Hawaiian Island, we have all the data available. We have actually really unique 360-degree um, video panoramics that we're filming so people can virtually tour these sites. And there's a lot of general info as well. All of this is on the Coral Health Atlas. So if you just Google Coral Health Atlas, it's the first link that pops up. It's through the university, and that's got a ton of information that we try to put out there so people can learn more. Okay. Well, all I can say in, in closing, John, is that we're we're counting on you. Uh, you know, you're you're a man at the frontier in this. Uh, <laughs> we're counting on you to, to uh, like like the rainforest to save the coral forests. <laughs> And uh, you know, do what you do in order to uh, save save the animals and the ecology by by indirect. So um, we we look to you in in Hilo, wherever you are, to carry <laughs> on the fight for coral. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much for coming on the show. That's John Burns, a coral researcher and PhD candidate at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, here on uh, the So West Hour on Think Tech Talks, talking about. 3D under the sea. Carry on the good work, John. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Aloha. Okay, John, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Jay. That was fun. Okay, talk again soon. Come on. Yeah, anytime you guys uh, need anything, just let me know. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, take care. Take care. Wow. Got to work on the sound. So many issues, my God.